This is Western Civilization One. I'm Dr. Young. Uh, I want to continue our conversation today about the Roman Empire. Talk about um, the structures of the empire uh, and its history from uh, the time of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, uh, that is the the dynasty of Augustus Caesar, through um, uh, about the uh, the end of the second century, maybe a little bit into the third century. Um, and uh, it's important to note at the outset that this is the period uh, during which uh, the empire functioned um, according, largely to, according to the system that Augustus Caesar set up. Later on in the third century, things kind of broke down, and then they would be reformed at the end of the third century by Diocletian. And so those will be um, topics for uh, the next lecture. Now, politically speaking, uh, and, and really in terms of power, the empire was divided between, uh, or rather the power of the empire was shared between a number of different entities. This was not entirely, in fact not really at all, an autocratic system. The emperor did have a tremendous amount of power. Um, uh, though the emperors after Augustus still continued to hold on to the uh, the idea, the facade, that they were operating within um, the parameters of the traditional republic. More and more those went away, but they still had to deal with uh, this, this great legacy of ancient Rome. There were still a lot of proponents of the old republican system who championed the values that the, republican, or that the republic represented. Uh, there were critics of the emperors, in fact. Um, uh, a couple of them, uh, well, we've encountered one of them already, Livy, uh, who wrote the account of the rape of Lucretia that we looked at in a previous lecture, um, was a you know, kind of nostalgic commentator on the days of the Republic, on the early days of uh, <clears throat> the creation of the Roman Republic and all that it represented. And, um, and, and Livy was writing uh, during the reign of Augustus and during the reign of... Uh, I think he, I can't remember the exact date of his death, but um, he's writing in the early days of the Republic, but really kind of nostalgic for everything that there were the, uh, or sorry, the, he wrote in the first days of the Empire, uh, but nostalgic for the, uh, the early days of the Republic. Uh, another um, commentator on this was a late first century, early second century historian named Tacitus, who wrote um, a work called the Annals of Imperial Rome, um, where he goes through the reign of the early emperors. Um, but he also is kind of nostalgic for the Republic and, and uh, offers some criticism of the ways that the emperors have changed uh, Rome, changed the way it functions, and, and really prevented Rome from realizing its potential, uh, which it had under the Republic. Um, and so, you know, the emperor had limitations placed on him. Now, uh, the reaction to the emperor also varied from place to place inside the empire. Uh, in the Eastern Empire, for instance, um, in places who, that were accustomed to autocratic rule, even ruled by a divine uh, monarch, uh, the emperor was hailed as a god. Um, in Egypt, this was definitely the case. In Asia Minor, uh, in some cases, um, and uh, they had no problem being ruled by an emperor. But uh, in Rome, uh, there was a lot of pushback to this, and there were other entities who continued to wield uh, some amount of power. And so the emperor had to share power, uh, particularly with the Senate. Um, and the Senate at times, you know, interfered in the lives of the emperors, even plotted uh, in some cases against the emperors. The other major emerging power, and really I shouldn't say emerging because it's already been a powerful entity, um, but uh, emerge, its power emerges in new ways uh, during the empire, that would be the army. Um, commanders of the army in particular uh, wielded outsized power in the Roman Empire. And in cases where there were weak emperors, um, senators and uh, uh, military commanders, uh, generals in the army, uh, would often um, make moves to challenge the authority of the emperor. Um, and uh, this, is, this is kind of a mess, uh, particularly after the death of Nero in the year 68. Um, because when Nero died, when he committed suicide, 
there was really no one, there, there was no clear heir uh, to the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Nero didn't have any children. The line had largely died out. Um, and there were probably some at that point who, who said, in fact, there, there were some who said, uh, we should return to the Republic. You know, we've, we've got a chance to get rid of the emperor. But by this point, I mean, it had been well more than a century uh, that the, the empire had existed. Um, and uh, there was, you know, there weren't a lot of people who uh, could imagine life now without an emperor. Um, and so, you know, there were a number of military generals who tried to lay claim to the title of emperor. There were also senators who tried to make moves to, to put one of them, uh, put themselves uh, on the throne. Um, and in the year 68, there were, in fact, four claimants to the, the imperial throne. Uh, there was a kind of battle between them, uh, different maneuvering uh, diplomatically and, and uh, militarily. And the one who emerged at the top of the heap was a guy named Vespasian, uh, who started a new dynasty, um, which is known as the Flavian dynasty, uh, which lasted only for about 30 years um, and only had three emperors, Vespasian and, and his two sons. Uh, but uh, this sent a message, or rather it established a precedent, that a military general could rise to the height of political power, could in fact, with the support of his troops, and with key with allies in key positions, place himself on the imperial throne. Um, and that lesson was never kind of lost on military generals. Uh, many of them, it seems, uh, through the, the couple of centuries of the existence of the empire, uh, sought opportunities to, um, to advance all the way to the imperial purple. Um, and so we're going to see uh, that happen more, particularly in the third century. Ultimately, with the death of Domitian, who was the last of the Flavian emperors uh, in the year 96 CE, um, the Senate and the military reached a kind of compromise um, uh, with each other, where uh, a senator named uh, Nerva um, was appointed to be the, the emperor. Domitian was a, a somewhat controversial emperor, and, and he was uh, assassinated. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, there was no Flavian left necessarily to take up the throne. And, you know, the Senate and, and the military um, uh, talked with each other, uh, reached this compromise, and Nerva became the, the emperor in the year 96. But with the stipulation that he would choose as his heir, um, not one of his own children or somebody from his own familia, but rather a military general named Trajan. Um, and so this was, this was again, the compromise reached between the, the Senate and the emperor. Uh, and so Nerva died only two years later, and in the year 98, Trajan became the emperor. Um, and Trajan uh, sort of learned the lesson of this compromise, and well before he died, he uh, appointed an heir, not from his own family. In fact, I'm not sure Trajan had any children. He was, um, uh, his, his primary, I guess, sexual identity was, yeah, he was homosexual, um, and so I don't think he ever produced any children. I could be wrong about that. But um, uh, in any case, he, um, he named uh, another military general named Hadrian as his heir. Um, and uh, when he died, Hadrian, and he w prepared him well in advance uh, to take up the throne. So there really was no question about who was to be the next emperor when Trajan died. Um, Hadrian did the same thing. Uh, with a fellow named Antoninus, uh, known as Antoninus Pius, uh, the pious one. Um, and so Antoninus became emperor after Hadrian, and then uh, the same thing happened with Antoninus. He chose uh, a guy named Marcus Aurelius as his heir. And what's interesting about these five emperors is that their heirs were not related to them by blood. Uh, rather, they were chosen um, through negotiations, uh, partly on the basis of their own capabilities, their own merit. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the factors in this was that none of these emperors necessarily had a clear heir within their own family. Um, but uh, it's this period, uh, which stretches through most of the second century, from 
uh, the reign of Nerva that began in 96 through the end of the reign of Marcus Aurelius uh, when he died in 180, that um, you know the empire seems to have reached a kind of height in political power, in stability. Um, uh, it expanded uh, during that time to encompass lands that it hadn't previously ruled, um, and we'll look at a map later to see the extent of it. Uh, but this was a, a time of, of tremendous stability. Um, the famous 18th century Enlightenment historian, uh, Edward Gibbon, whose famous work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, um, has influenced the view of Rome ever since. Uh, I should say that Gibbon's view is definitely outmoded, outdated at this point. Uh, most people do not follow Gibbon, uh, myself included. Uh, but Gibbon argued that the second century of the Roman Empire represented the time, uh, the kind of supreme time in human history when peace and stability reigned, when uh, the, the sole goal of all uh, politics and economics and everything was human happiness. Uh, Gibbon saw this as, as really the greatest period in human history. Uh, that's the part that historians don't really follow anymore. Um, uh, they think that Gibbon is sort of overly romanticizing this 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 point in time. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, th this, that stability came partly because the position of emperor was um, was uh, accepted by both the army and the senate. The other, in other words, the other two entities that really wielded power. Now, after the death of Marcus Aurelius, his son Commodus uh, became the next emperor, and he was a controversial one, uh, really quite an incapable fellow uh, who may have had um, delusions, may have even been insane. Uh, Commodus styled, styled himself a, a great gladiator. He, he actually fought uh, from time to time in sort of staged battles uh, where you know, there, were, there were reminders there making sure that Commodus was not going to be hurt uh, while he was fighting in the, uh, in the arena. Um, and so they, they set out sacrificial slave gladiators to fight against him. Um, but, uh, you know, it, Commodus it was a, a really strange individual. Um, uh, and, and he was quite unpopular. Um, and so when Commodus died, there was a, another kind of squabble for the throne. And uh, a new dynasty based in military power, the uh, Severan dynasty, uh, eventually emerged as the kind of the, the, the uh, dynasty uh, controlling the empire. And really, the third century represents this time when uh, the army uh, was in charge, and the position of emperor was uh, every generation fought over between different um, uh, different generals. And and you know, I'll I'll have more to say about that when we get into uh, the next lecture and start to talk about Diocletian. Um, so there was this balance between the the emperor, the army, uh, the senate. Uh, in periods where there were very strong emperors, like uh, during the reigns of Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus, and Marcus Aurelius, um, you know there was there was a lot of stability, and and uh, the Senate and the army uh, were lined up behind the emperor, um, and and you know not a lot of intrigue going on or anything like that. But in the in the third century, for instance, uh, the army wielded outsized influence and and really. Um, made and uh, uh, removed at times, many times actually, emperors uh, from the throne. Um, now, what, the other thing we have to realize about the Roman Empire was that it was not a terribly centralized entity. That is, you know, the affairs of this vast and diverse emperor were not, uh, empire were not all directed by the emperor or even by the emperor in tandem with the Senate and the army uh, and others. Um, a great deal of autonomy was granted to local elites. Now, because the empire represented stability, because power uh, really came from connection with the emperor and with other uh, important officials in Rome itself, these client, or rather these local elites, um, often uh, refashion their identity to become more Roman. Rome got a lot of buy-in from people, even people who were not native Romans. And from time to time, uh, the emperors opened up the, the gates, so to speak, and extended citizenship to wider segments of the population throughout Rome. Um, 
uh, usually people who had done something to demonstrate their loyalty and demonstrate their Roman identity. Uh, an interesting example of this comes from the New Testament, uh, the Christian book of Scripture, uh, which we'll have some more to say about uh, in the next lecture. Um, but uh, one of the key figures in the New Testament, in fact, arguably the most important uh, figure of all after Jesus himself, was a guy named Paul. Uh, Paul he was known as Paul of Tarsus. Um, and one of the things that we learn about Paul in that text is that he was a Roman citizen. Now, this seems a little odd because Paul came from Tarsus, which is a city, uh, a rather obscure city in Asia Minor, uh, not, a, not even a terribly important population center necessarily, uh, but from, you know, a, a place in Asia Minor. He was not an Italian. He was not Roman. Um, he's also Jewish, um, and uh, which, you know, may have been a strike against him in the view of some, but somehow his family had obtained Roman citizenship. And Paul was uh, doing uh, all of, uh, pursuing his activities, which we'll have, again, more to say about next lecture, uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s CE. Um, and so during the reigns of uh, Tiberius and uh, uh, Caligula and Claudius and Nero, um, uh, the latter part of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Um, and so at some point, his family had, had somehow gained Roman citizenship. It's thought that his father probably had uh, been an important uh, local ally of some Roman governor or some other Roman official, and through that channel uh, had been given Roman citizenship, and his son, uh, Paul, uh, inherited that. Now, this balance between the centralized uh, authorities and the local elites was, is, is really key to understanding how the Roman Empire operated, how it governed itself. Rome did not have much of a bureaucracy, at least not in the central government. Um, if Rome governed places directly, as it did in some cases, it would send out governors most often from either, well, from the senatorial ranks, and so there were still a few hundred senators, or um, increasingly from the next tier of uh, kind of Roman society, the one, uh, the, the rank of uh, people just under the senators, who were known as the equestrians. Um, you might think, okay, did they ride horses or something? Well, Equestrian really uh, refers to the fact that they were they were the cavalry in the Roman army. Um, uh, that was kind of their the the, the association that they had uh, in the Republican days. Um, and so you know this group called the Equestrians was only a few hundred uh, strong. And so in total there were about a thousand people who were involved in the actual running of the central government in Rome, and that's it. Some of them were appointed as governors to go off to the far-flung provinces, but most often, or at least just as often, Rome tried to govern its provinces through local rulers, uh, client rulers, in fact. Uh, a really good example of this, oh, and let me note that um, these client rulers had a, a good deal of autonomy, Rome uh, followed the lead of the Persian Empire in um, behaving in ways that were highly tolerant of diversity. Uh, Rome really was not that interested. Not it didn't uh, concern itself much with, you know, the the gods that people worshipped, with uh, the way they govern themselves, the way they organize themselves socially. So long as uh, those methods of social organization and, and religious belief. Um, did not directly threaten the stability of the empire as long as people were paying their taxes, uh, as long as they were not openly rebelling. Uh, for the most part, the Romans were willing to live and let live. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, the, the governing situation of the provinces changed from time to time. Uh, there were, you know, provinces that started out as client kingdoms, um, uh, but eventually became directly ruled by Rome. Um, and let me go to the map on the next slide here, um, if I can get it to advance. Okay, it advanced too far. Um, I, I'm having computer issues, so this thing doesn't always behave itself. Anyway, this is a map that shows the Roman provinces. Now, it should be noted, uh, as it says up here on the map, this map is not based on a specific time frame. 
Rome never held all of this territory at the same time. Rather, it, uh, in different emperors uh, focused their efforts on conquering uh, or subjecting uh, different places, and uh, some emperors let go of territories that had been conquered by previous emperors. A good example would be uh, Trajan, um, who ruled at the beginning of the second century, managed to conquer Mesopotamia, which was ruled by uh, a Persian dynasty known as the Parthians. Uh, the Parthians had been historic enemies of Rome, and uh, Trajan marched his army down here and conquered all the way to the Persian Gulf, uh, the entirety of the, the Tigris and Euphrates Valley um, uh, became Roman territory. Um, when Trajan passed, uh, the Emperor Hadrian uh, decided that Mesopotamia was just too far away and it was going to be too difficult to govern this territory, which was really quite populous, and of course uh, had ancient societies who didn't necessarily like to be ruled by the Romans. Uh, Mesopotamia still had a lot of the problems of instability that it had anciently, uh, or, or more anciently, I should say. And so Hadrian really kind of let Mesopotamia lapse um, and pulled a lot of the army and, and the, the Roman officials out of there. And Mesopotamia was, as a consequence, reconquered by the Persians, but th this time by a new dynasty of Persians called the Sassanids. And I'll have more to say about the Sassanids when we look at uh, late antiquity, um, because they become really one of the key uh, rivals to Rome and, and a source of some instability there. Um, Hadrian instead focused a lot of his attention elsewhere. Uh, he, for instance, built a wall up here between the Roman province of Britannia, uh, which included all of what is now England and, and uh, Wales. Uh, but he built a wall up here really kind of on the border of... Uh, what is now England and Scotland um, uh, to separate Britannia from the lands to the north and unfortunately they're off the map there but um, if you know the geography of the British Isles they extend up into Scotland here and Scotland was inhabited anciently by a group of people called the Picts uh, P-I-C-T-S um, a Celtic people who were hostile to Roman interests and so you know Hadrian built this defensive wall to make sure that the Picts would remain inside of uh, their their own lands um, and, you know, Hadrian had other, other interests. The other thing we should note is that, um, you know, many of these lands, like uh, the, especially these uh, provinces, if we can call them that, north of the Danube River there, uh, were really not provinces, but were rather client kingdoms. That is, the kings of Noricum and Raetia and Pannonia, uh, you know, these lands that are now Austria and Switzerland and, and places like that, um, uh, agreed to subject themselves to Roman rule, or at least to become tributaries. They paid tribute to the Romans uh, in return for Roman protection, for trade in Roman arms, uh, for good economic uh, uh, conditions and, and uh, such things. And so, you know, Rome did not rule any of these places directly. They didn't send troops necessarily into Raetia. Uh, Raetia or into Noricum um, and uh, try to govern it directly. A really good example of the, uh, the potential to um, change the way a province was governed is the province of Judea down here. Now Judea is uh, maybe best known for um, the fact that it was the it was kind of the Jewish province of Rome. Uh, this is the historic homeland of the Jews and um, uh, the, the majority of the population in Judea was Jewish. Uh, when Judea first became Roman territory, it was ruled by a monarch named Herod. And Herod, uh, sorry for the yawn, uh, Herod was um, known as Herod the Great. Um, he actually was a, a kind of client of Marcus Antonius um, and uh, allied himself with him uh, during the civil war between um, Marcus Antonius and, and Octavian. Um, but when Octavian won, when it became clear that, that Marcus Antonius was no longer going to be the power there, uh, Herod quickly cozied up to Octavian, uh, said, look, you know, proof of, of how good a client I can be is my relationship with your rival. Uh, I served him well, and I can serve you just as well. And Octavian, feeling magnanimous, um, uh, agreed to make Herod his client, and so Judea became a client state. And during the reign of Herod, which extended to uh, 4 BCE, um, or thereabouts, uh, the dates are, are really kind of uncertain there, um, uh, 
uh, Herod was a client king, and and even though there were some Roman soldiers and other other uh, Roman features that uh, made it into Judea, for the most part, this was governed autonomously. When Herod died, he decided he wanted to divide his kingdom up between his four sons, rather than hand all of the kingdom over to a single son. And uh, the Romans at this point said. Well, you can go ahead and do that for your purposes, but we want to keep Judea together as a province. And so, uh, you know, the Roman government sent um, a governor uh, to, to govern over that place directly. And so the governor existed in um, uh, collusion with the, the native kings of Judea, um, which again was divided up into four sections, each one ruled by a son of Herod. But uh, the, the Roman governor uh, w was the governor for the Roman purposes over the entire province of Judea. Well, I, think, I can't seem to do these lectures without yawning for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, I guess I'm not getting enough, uh, digging enough breaths or something. Um, anyway, uh, now the most famous governor of Judea is, uh, was a guy named Pontius Pilate, um, who, if you know anything about the New Testament, uh, was the Roman official who ordered the execution of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, uh, and so I may have more to say about that later, but um, you know he was the, the Roman governor. But if you read the New Testament carefully, you'll see that uh, Pilate often defers his decisions to the, the various sons of Herod who were still ruling that territory at that point. Um, when Jesus is brought before him, for instance, and you know accused of sedition, uh, of rebellion, um, Pilate says, well, this isn't my jurisdiction, you need to send him to Herod, and by that it was the, the, the son of Herod who was ruling in Jerusalem, um, and he gets sent to Herod, and Herod's like, well, this is a religious matter, you need to send him to the high priest, and ultimately this gets, gets back to Pontius Pilate, who makes the ultimate decision to have him uh, executed by the, um, by the method of crucifixion. Um, so, you know, th these provinces could change in the way they were governed uh, over time, and Judea is, is an example of that. Now, um, the other thing that we should note about uh, uh, the Roman Empire is it is a highly urban empire. Each of these provinces um, had a key city or two that housed the apparatus of Roman government. This meant that most people who lived in the empire, because probably 90 plus percent of the population of the Roman Empire lived in rural settings. They were farmers. Most of them were peasants. Many of them were slaves. Um, and so the vast majority of people, on a day-to-day -day basis at least, and, and perhaps even over the course of a lifetime, had almost no contact with Roman officials, who remained, for the most part, in the cities. Now, they felt their influence because, uh, you know, the Romans collected taxes from all over the empire. And so, you know, Roman officials would um, uh, set up systems where they would uh, procure the produce um, from the farmers, um, and this would be brought into the cities um, and maybe sent to, to other parts of the empire. And there was a whole, you know, economic apparatus to make sure that uh, the food supply was operating uh, and feeding the cities and everything. Uh, so the Romans were really quite quite highly organized, uh, but they did all of that organization through their key cities. Um, back to the example of Judea, the Roman governor uh, Pontius Pilate did not, you know, probably ever, uh, maybe only infrequently, go out and kind of tour the rural environs of his province. He stayed in the key cities of Caesarea on the coast and Jerusalem um, uh, in the interior up on the, the kind of the, the mountains uh, that run through Judea. Um, so, you know, that's that was where the Romans preferred to, to be, preferred to live. Uh, this is a bit ironic given that, you know, Rome had uh, this very strong rural agrarian identity to it. Um, that was a part of, important part of the ethos of the Romans, but the empire definitely was governed through these cities. Um, and in fact, the, you know, I mean, the cities were to some extent one of the, the great keys to the stability of the empire. So 
I want to talk about a few keys uh, to the success of the empire, to its longevity, to its stability. Um, and maybe uh, it's been pointed out by many historians, and I think that this is uh, the proper way to look at things, that there were really two factors more than anything that kept the empire together. One of these is the military. Uh, military is the way the Romans got buy-in. You might think that this is the way they oppressed people, but really the Romans were not a terribly oppressive uh, empire. They again, they were you know they tolerated a great deal of diversity, um, but uh, they did maintain the peace extremely well through having this very large military, hundreds of thousands of soldiers strong. Uh, organized into these things called legions uh, that spread particularly in the frontier regions of the empire. And one of the paths to prosperity, in fact, was through joining the army. It was a, a great commitment, um, 20 or 30 year commitment. Um, it was an itinerant lifestyle. Soldiers could be shipped off to different parts of the empire at a moment's notice. Uh, they didn't tend to stay in the same location for their entire time in the army. And so a soldier might start out, for instance, in Asia Minor here, uh, and then, you know, get shipped up to uh, the Rhine frontier up here, maybe even up to Britannia, and then maybe down here along the Danube at some point in his career, and then maybe over here into the east, uh, over to Syria or Judea or someplace like that. Uh, and so, the you know, the soldiers had to put up with that, but the Romans accepted not only Roman citizens into the army. Anyone who, you know, was uh, um, a free person in, living inside of the Roman Empire could join the army and maybe even use that as a path to citizenship and privilege. And so, you know, the, the, the army was a, a kind of great leveling mechanism that brought people of different backgrounds, uh, different ethnicities, different uh, homelands together, uh, and produced buy-in um, uh, by people all over the empire. Um, and it, of course, maintained peace and stability. Um, the army doubled as a kind of police force uh, all through the provinces. Um, there was a a police force in the city of Rome as well called the Praetorian Guard, uh, whose main task was to protect the emperor, but um, they also, you know, functioned as a kind of um, peacekeeping force there, um, or police force in the city of Rome. Um, and so it did have these structures, and, and uh, you know, this, this lent itself to a great deal of stability. The other key to stability is the Mediterranean. Now, you might think that the sea like this, which is the largest sea in the world, by the way, um, the largest body of water apart from the, the, uh, the four oceans, uh, you might think that a sea would be a divisive mechanism, that um, it would cut off the people of, say, North Africa or Egypt from the people of Asia Minor or uh, the Mediterranean coastline here uh, to the north, to, in Italy or Hispania or Gaul or someplace like that. But in fact, the Mediterranean served to unite these peoples. Um, the historic division between Africa and Europe, um, which has persisted now for a millennium and a half or so, was not there during the Roman Empire. Um, you know, there was frequent trade and contact between uh, different parts of the empire because the Mediterranean is really quite navigable. There are occasional storms and other things that um, blow up on the Mediterranean, but it is not nearly so volatile a body of water as some others uh, it found in other parts of the world. Um, uh, moreover, the Romans had a very strong navy that uh, protected the sea against pirates. Um, there were pirates, but uh, you know there was an effort to make sure that they didn't make too great a nuisance of themselves. Um, and all of this lent itself very well to, you know, long-distance trade, uh, to uh, immigration from one part of the empire to another, and, and really the Mediterranean served to unite uh, peoples with each other and to get, again, to produce buy-in uh, by peoples all over the empire. A couple of other keys to uh, stability. Um, uh, oh, I, you know, I realized that I, I neglected to talk about a, an important uh, primary source that you were assigned to read. So let me, um, as I'm, you know, talking about these links between people and, and kind of to return to the point about the provinces and things like that, 
Um, let's take a look at, and I didn't put this on the PowerPoint because I, I just wanted to point out a few of the examples here. Um, but this correspondence between Pliny and Trajan. Uh, Pliny was appointed to be the governor of the province of Bithynia. Now if we go back to the PowerPoint and look here, Bithynia is this province up here on the southern coast of the Black Sea, so the northern part of Asia Minor here. Um, and you know, Pliny was a, a, a senator. Um, uh, his father, um, Pliny the Elder, uh, this is Pliny the Younger, uh, was a, a famous author um, whose works uh, remained important for many centuries, uh, particularly his works on kind of scientific works, works on uh, observations from nature and things like that. But uh, his son went into politics um, and was appointed governor of Bithynia. And you can see here the kinds of issues that these um, Roman governors had to deal with. And, and uh, Trajan made sure that he kept up a uh, a kind of constant stream of correspondence with the emperor. Um, this may be because he uh, wanted to kind of remain in the in the view of the emperor, um, because contact with the emperor was the the source of honor and and reputation and everything. Uh, at times, Pliny comes across as a kind of a uh, helpless individual who can't do anything, can't even kind of wipe his own nose without um, getting the emperor's permission. Um, but this is a, a very revealing um, set of, of documents here. So, um, you know, uh, so this one's a kind of famous uh, example. Um, uh, he um, writes to Pl he writes to Trajan and he says, uh, there was a big fire that broke out in the city of Nicomedia. Um, which was um, the most important city in Bithynia at the time, uh, kind of the capital there, and uh, consumed several buildings. And uh, the, one of the problems was that there, there really was no, um, as it says, single public fire engine. That doesn't mean they had cars back then. It means uh, like a wagon that had buckets on it and things like that. Or a bucket in the place and not one solitary appliance for mastering the fire, mastering a fire. Um, so what do you think about appointing a fire company of about 150 men to make sure that if a fire breaks out in Nicomedia that they can take care of it rapidly, right? Um, and uh, one of the things he says that may sound puzzling here is, I will take care that not one, that no one not a genuine fireman shall be admitted and that the guild shall not misapply the charter granted to it. Right. Um, now, Trajan writes back, and you might think this is a no-brainer. Yeah, form a fire company. Let's make sure that these people are safe. But Trajan actually opposes this. All right. He says, you have formed the idea of a possible fire company at Nicomedia on the model of various others already existing. So apparently this, this kind of company existed in other parts of the empire. But remember that the province of Bithynia, and especially city-states like Nicomedia, are the prey of factions. Give them the name we may, and however good be the reasons for organization, such associations will soon degenerate into dangerous secret societies. It is better policy to provide fire apparatus and encourage property holders to make use of them, and if need comes, press the crowd which collects into the same service. In other words, don't create some kind of association which can lead to identification uh, with each other, uh, even to a kind of secret society forming that might threaten Roman power, uh, Roman stability and good governance of that province, right? There are already too many factions, too many groups in Bithynia, he says, and so we don't need another group which can, you know, even if the purpose is um, uh, is good, will soon degenerate into, as he says, dangerous secret societies, right? So yeah, provide all the equipment and make sure the people who own the houses know where it is, and they will be incentivized to take this up and uh, if there's a fire that breaks out, they will quickly move to uh, put it out because they don't want to get their houses destroyed. And that way we don't have this kind of permanent uh, organization to it that can threaten our interests there. 
Um, so you can see the, the sorts of uh, incentives at work here, the problems that the Romans uh, encountered in trying to govern these territories, um, you know, the, the both acknowledgement and fear that the, of the independence that people have, uh, kind of the autonomy that they have, right? The other really famous letter uh, from this collection is this one down here, and it's by far the longest. Let me just summarize it. Pliny writes to Trajan, and he says um, uh, that he has uncovered a group of Christians in Bithynia. And he doesn't really know what to do with them. He knows they have been prosecuted um, for uh, believing in weird things um, uh, in other places in the empire, but he has not been present at any of those uh, uh, trials or the interrogations. And so, um, you know, he doesn't really know what to do with them. And, and he's really at uh, a loss as to how to describe them. And this is uh, demonstrative, actually, of kind of Roman attitudes toward Christianity. And I'm going to, you know, talk um, at length about Christianity in the next lecture. Um, but one of the things that I, I will say now, and I'll say again then, is that Romans really were confused by Christians. Um, they, they didn't understand, first of all, why anyone would worship a, a mortal human being who had, moreover, been executed for rebellion against Rome. That didn't make any sense to them. Um, and they were confused by some of the practices of Christians. Um, and, you know, Pliny here says, look, I, I can't necessarily find any real fault with what they're doing other than they're kind of doing it in secret. Um, and so please instruct me on what to do. And the emperor writes back and he says, um, look, we can't, we simply cannot, um, tolerate secret societies, you know, whatever there, there is. Um, uh, and the Christians seem to be doing this. Now we shouldn't, you know, he, he says down here, the Christians are not to be hunted out. In other words, we're not going to, you know, perform a kind of witch hunt here, um, you know, rooting out Christians. We're not going to form new government bodies to make sure that we get rid of all the Christians. But if you discover Christians, um, they are to be punished. This is an offense uh, because they're doing things in secret that um, they're, they're up to no good, right? Um, and we're going to give them a chance to deny they're a Christian um, by offering prayer to our gods, and this was common for, for people uh, all over the Roman Empire, to worship the gods the Romans worshipped, or at least to give some sort of obeisance to them. Uh, but they also, you know, would worship their own local or regional gods uh, in addition to that. Um, the one group that did obtain an exemption from, you know, making a sacrifice to the Roman gods was the Jews. Um, but the Christians don't have that exem exemption here. They're new and, and unfamiliar. And so if anyone denies by, you know, denies Christianity by making a sacrifice to our gods, then you let them go, right? Um, it's not in this collection, but Pliny actually writes back to Trajan and says, well, I thought that's what you'd say, so I, um, I went ahead and just had all of these Christians that we rounded up executed. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, it, it was good to get the confirmation from the emperor that, that he had done the right thing there. Okay, um, and you can look through the other um, the cases or the other letters here and, and you know, try to discern um, the kinds of concerns that uh, these Roman officials have or that the Romans dealt with as they tried to govern this far, far flung and, and diverse empire. All right, back to the, the keys to success here. Um, I'll mention um, three other things. Uh, one of these is law. The Romans had a, an incredibly flexible and effective legal system. Um, they, uh, they had actually two systems of law, one that governed uh, entirely Roman citizens um, and, and gave them special privileges, and another one called the Jus Gentium, or the Law of Peoples, or the Law of Nations, that was flexible and uh, allowed for a great deal of diversity and really was tailor-made for uh, the governing of this huge empire. Um, and uh, the Romans were, were really quite rigid and consistent in their, um, their execution of laws. Uh, as you, you know, saw to some extent in the, the correspondence between Pliny and Trajan. Um, and so this, this offered a great deal of stability and predictability in the empire. Um, people became invested in uh, Rome because it um, provided a legal framework in which different peoples could live together 
uh, but also you know was not arbitrary and capricious um, necessarily. Uh, two other keys to Roman success. One of them is city planning. Everywhere the Romans went, they created cities, or in many cases rebuilt cities, on a template that was the same everywhere. I like to say when I teach this in the classroom that Romans were like viruses. They went into places that they had conquered, that they governed, and they rewrote the DNA of the place. That is, they, you know, they refashioned the city so that it looked like every other city in the Roman Empire. And so it was predictable. No matter where you traveled in the empire, you could expect to find certain amenities, certain things. To some extent, we see this in the United States. You know, no matter where you go, you're going to find a Walmart, and you're going to find a McDonald's, and you're probably going to find a Lowe's or a Home Depot so you can do home improvement things, and you're going to find uh, supermarkets that have essentially the same sorts of things. You know, every supermarket, whether it's Publix or Kroger or Safeway or Albertsons or, you know, I mean, these are different grocery chains in different parts of the, of the country, uh, pretty much have the same things. They may have their own store brands, but, you know, there's always going to be, uh, you know, the same flavors of ice cream and the same, you know, fruits and vegetables offered in these places and the same, you know, there's always going to be a butcher in, in the supermarket. So you get exactly what you, you need everywhere. Um, and it's predictable, right? Um, well, that was that was how Rome operated. It provided certain amenities in every city that it, it created or refashioned. Um, let's look at an example here. All right, this is the Roman, this is a map of the Roman city of Jerosh. Uh, Jerosh was in the Roman province of Arabia Petraea, so all the way down here on the southeastern uh, frontier of the Roman Empire. Uh, Jerosh is one of the best preserved Roman cities uh, currently in existence. Um, it's uh, in the it's in the the suburbs of what is now Amman, Jordan, um, and uh, it has been excavated extremely carefully, and it's a wonderful place to go to see how Rome operated. Um, Rome produced in every city that it had five basic things. The same five features existed everywhere. Uh, the first of these, and this is in no particular order, um, the first of these is a hippodrome. Okay, you can see the hippodrome on the map here. Uh, this is the hippodrome. This is a picture of the hippodrome in Jerosh. Um, the hippodrome was for entertainment, and particularly uh, the Romans' favorite form of entertainment, which was chariot racing. Um, uh, that was by far the most popular sport in Rome. Uh, there were huge crowds that turned out all over the empire for uh, chariot racing. Um, there were, in fact, teams that competed, uh, teams of chariot racers um, that competed with each other. Um, the, the big leagues, so to speak, was in the city of Rome itself, in the arena known as the Circus Maximus, the Circus Maximus, um, which seated upwards of a quarter million people. I mean, it's the same size seating capacity as like Daytona Speedway, um, but a much, much smaller track. And uh, there were four teams of chariots, uh, the blues, the whites, the greens, and the reds. Uh, the blues and greens were the most popular and the most successful of these. But all over the empire, there were franchise factions of these same teams. And so you could go and see, I mean, this is kind of like the minor leagues. Now go to a place like Jerosh, go to the Hippodrome, and you're going to see the blues racing the greens or the whites racing the reds. Um, and uh, chariot racers could even kind of move up uh, the ranks like minor league baseball players can move up uh, uh, to the big leagues, right? Um, uh, but there were, you know, local talent and things like this as well. Um, and so in the Hippodrome, I mean, this is the place where uh, people went to be entertained. There were also, you know, shows of gladiators and, and other things uh, that were uh, performed in, in the Hippodrome. A second feature is what is known as the Cardo. This is a main street. If you, if you want to spot a Roman city, this is the thing you look for. A colonnaded main street that runs right through the center of the city and everything else, all the other major features of the city, are along it. The Cardo starts over here 
uh, with the Arch of Hadrian. Hadrian visited this place and, and had an arch erected uh, Jerosh um, to commemorate his, his visit there, um, uh, a monumental arch. And so it starts at the Arch of Hadrian, extends past the Hippodrome, over here past a, a temple and a theater, uh, down here, you know, you know, by the bathhouse and, and uh, another theater, and then the main temple of the city uh, to the patron goddess Artemis. Um, and so that's the Cardo, and all along the Cardo, as you can see here, there were columns, um, and uh, this is a wide main street. Uh, carts could pass uh, two at a time along this. In fact, the Cardo in Jerosh has uh, ruts from the many centuries of carts passing along it. Um, uh, and so this is this is a, a definite feature that, that one could spot. Um, I uh, there's the in Jerusalem. Uh, this is another good example. Um, in Jerusalem, there is this spot in the city. It's kind of a museum, um, which has bronze models of the city in every era of its history. So it starts with the ancient city of David, and you know, kind of goes forward in, tr in time. And one of the the starkest uh, uh, changes that one sees in the layout of the city of Jerusalem is during the Roman period, when it goes from being kind of this sprawling mass of small lanes and alleys to having this main street running right through it with columns, uh, uh, you know, lining that street. Um, that's exactly what the Romans did everywhere they went. Was built this cardo, and and that was you know the predictable sort of. If you want to see a you want to spot a Roman city from space, you know, you look for the Cardo, so to speak. I mean, I don't think you can literally see it from space, but that's the, the cliche there. Third feature is a temple. Um, temple is not just a place to go to, to worship the patron god or goddess. This was the key uh, gathering place for the whole city to observe festivals, um, uh, rituals. Uh, uh, the temple is absolutely gigantic in Jerosh. It's as big as the Hippodrome and, and wider. Um, uh, probably several football fields long here, okay, hundreds of yards from from the, the gates uh, or the entrance to the temple on the Cardo to the back side of it. Uh, the sanctuary, um, uh, kind of where the statue of the goddess uh, was placed, um, is uh, in the, uh, the, the back interior of that. That's what's pictured here, okay, uh, in Jerosh. Um, the whole temple precinct is absolutely gigantic. And so it could fit probably the entire community inside of it for a religious festival with room to spare. Um, there's a lower part of the temple, and then there are 49 steps that take you up to the upper part of the temple, uh, and all of this precinct is, is absolutely gigantic. Um, there was no, like in Greece, there was no separation between church and state in Rome, uh, government officials were also responsible for the religious festivals, the religious observances, um, and uh, you know the temple was the place they they operated to do those things. A fourth feature is a theater, and this is borrowed to some extent from the Greeks. The Romans did make some modifications. Uh, theaters were used for different purposes in Rome than they were in, in Greece as well. Uh, the Romans, early in their history, in the Republic, uh, in the 3rd and 2nd centuries, um, developed a taste for Greek-style theater, um, particularly the, the, the comedies of the Roman playwrights Plautus and Terence. Um, and uh, for you know, some time these were performed, but as Roman history um, wore on, the Romans seemed to have um, not enjoyed uh, traditional Greek-style plays as much um, and instead went in for more lowbrow humor or at times blood sport. Um, and so uh, things like gladiator fights and uh, uh, public executions. Um, and as we saw in the Res Geste of Augustus, beast hunts, where they would import these exotic animals and then kill them um, in creative ways for the enjoyment of the entire population. Well, these are the kinds of things that would have been uh, performed in theaters, and uh, the Romans then adapted this and created um, what is called an amphitheater, or a theater in the round, um, and, in, and some of these are, are really huge. Uh, the largest of these, of course, is the one in Rome, built by the Flavian emperors, Vespasian and Titus and Domitian, uh, known as the Flavian Amphitheater, or more commonly known as the Colosseum. 
and the Colosseum seated upwards of 50,000 people, and there were all sorts of things that were done in the Colosseum. It really was a kind of technological marvel. Uh, they had trap doors. They had a whole thing under the floor of the arena where they could that they could use for, you know, introducing animals or gladiators into the arena through trap doors. Um, they could even seal the floor of the arena and then flood it and perform like mock naval battles in the arena. So that it was a multi-use uh, facility, all for the entertainment of Romans. Um, in the eastern part of the empire, there, there were especially, but not just in the east, there were some of these in the west as well. There were Greek-style theaters with the, um, so a half circle with what's known as the skene, um, what we would call the stage. And then, you know, this, this whole uh, large wall behind it with different doors for introducing, you know, figures into the entertainments. Um, and uh, there were also political gatherings that were held here, political speeches and other things. And so this is another key gathering place for people in the city uh, to be entertained and to, uh, to um, uh, interact with each other. The last of these uh, features of a Roman city was the bathhouse. Every Roman city had at least one bathhouse. And this is arguably the most important because Romans liked to bathe. Or rather, they liked to go to the bathhouse. Elite Romans went every day for several hours. Um, they didn't necessarily have, you know, jobs that they had to work on a constant basis like uh, most of the, the working people in Rome. And so they would go there in the morning and spend all day there. Um, even, you know, working class Romans, so to speak, went to the bathhouse probably on an almost everyday basis, though not for several hours. They would go for maybe an hour or two, hour or two after work. Much like English people go to the pubs or people who live in New York go to a tavern uh, after work or something like that, they would, they would go to the bathhouse. Um, well, what happens in the bathhouse? People do bathe in the bathhouse, getting clean was something that was prized by Romans, an activity prized by Romans. Um, and they had a whole regimen for doing this. This is uh, uh, a layout of the, the largest, uh, or one of the largest of the bathhouses in the whole empire, the Baths of Caracalla in Rome. Um, and there were three different pools. Uh, in this case, there are actually four. Um, but uh, uh, there is what is known as the Tepidarium, um, uh, sorry, the Tepidarium is here, um, the Collidarium, and the Frigidarium. Um, the uh, Collidarium is the hot room. Uh, so this is right by the furnace. The hottest water, the, the newly heated water comes in here. And uh, it was probably too hot for most uh, people to get into. Uh, and so they would sit in there and enjoy the steam. Uh, they would sweat. They would then rub oil on their bodies and scrape the oil and sweat and dirt off with uh, metal uh, scrapers called striggles, and that's how they got clean. Um, then they would often go into the warm room or the tepidarium, uh, where the water is, is warm but no longer scalding hot, and they would spend some time there. This is where they would dip themselves in and kind of rinse off all the rest of the, uh, uh, the oil and things. Um, uh, and then, you know, then they would go into the Frigidarium, which was the unheated, uh, or rather the, the coolest of the three pools. And this is where they would just sort of hang out, uh, sit in the water, enjoy each other's company, socialize. Uh, the Basil Caracalla also had what was known as the, well, the Piscina is the word in, in, um, in Italian here. Um, but this is a public swimming pool. Like people would go and swim laps in there and things like that. Right. Each of these pools is absolutely gigantic. We're talking like massive public swimming pool size for the Frigidarium, for the Piscina, for the Tepidarium, the, or for, the, for the Collidarium, I should say. The Tepidarium was somewhat smaller um, than that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, these are all places that could fit hundreds, if not thousands, of people on a regular basis. Um, but the bathhouse was not just a place to go and kind of sit in the water. It was also a place to socialize. It was a place to work out. Uh, the palestre, and this is divided into two because one side is for women, one side is for men. I'm not sure which one is the women or men. I just pointed to, to two randomly. Uh, but this is a play, This is more like a, a Greek-style gymnasium, a place where the Romans would go and work out. Um, 
They would run and lift weights and wrestle. They had ball games they would play there. Uh, it's kind of like a health club uh, today. Um, and so, you know, a Roman might go and work out uh, in the palestre and then, you know, go do the whole bathing regimen. There were lots of other rooms where they could go to get a massage or to just sit and talk. Uh, bathhouses had libraries. They had lecture rooms. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of an all-purpose facility uh, for people to gather. And again, most Romans did this on an almost daily basis. Um, this was their main place to, to hang out and to socialize. And because they prized cleanliness, they would even bring the slaves in once or twice a week and give them an hour or two to bathe. Right? That's how important the bathhouse was for the Romans. Uh, the other uh, place you see here the, um, in Italian, the spoliati, uh, spoliatoi, um, was the, these are the changing rooms. And so, you know, there were lots of workers who uh, uh, were employed by the bathhouse to ensure that uh, people, you know, got their, uh, the proper equipment, uh, that they could store their, their articles without fear of them being stolen and things like this. Um, these sorts of institutions do exist in certain parts of Europe today, uh, particularly in Turkey and some places in Eastern Europe. Um, I was in uh, Hungary, for instance, this uh, just a, a couple of months ago, and um, uh, a friend and I were there, and, and we decided to go to a bathhouse, and it was a Roman-style bathhouse. Uh, we got there and, you know, checked in, um, uh, got the whole kit, uh, which included, you know, a, a towel and some swimming trunks and uh, some other things, and then um, I actually decided that I, it, was, it was quite costly, and I didn't have enough money to pay for it, so... I left and went and did some other things, but my friend said it was a glorious experience to go in there and just kind of hang out. I mean, it was like a swimming pool. It's not like a place where everybody goes and gets naked and, you know, parades around scandalously in front of each other or something like that. You know, he was, you know, everybody's sitting in swim trunks or towels or something and, you know, they go and just sort of hang out and, and enjoy the water and, and uh, the steam and everything. And it's, you know, supposed to be quite a healthy experience. So this was all part of the culture of Rome. Uh, this is really more of a cultural institution than a utilitarian one. The last key to success, um, oh, actually, let me pause and talk about this for a second. This is another Roman city, um, the city of Scatopolis. This was in the province of Judea. And the reason I like this picture is you can see kind of all of the major features. Uh, the cardo is readily identifiable. Uh, over here, this whole precinct was the bathhouse. Uh, here you can see a theater. When I took this picture, I was standing on a hill uh, where the temple was, and so the cardo runs right by that. And then just off of it here um, is the uh, the hippodrome. Um, so all five features are you know in close proximity to each other. The last key to success, and, and really this is bound up with the discussion of city planning as well, was that Rome provided lots of public amenities, public works. Everything from, and if I were to ask you what this is and ask for some guesses, I imagine I'd probably get a lot of different responses, mostly puzzlement. Uh, I'll answer it for you. This is a public restroom, a public toilet facility uh, in you know ancient Rome, or this is actually in Scatopolis. Um, uh, in the ancient days, they would have had a running channel of water here, and people would sit uh, perched over you know, the, the gap between these two pillars that are sticking out from the wall there. Um, they do their business and, uh, you know, the water carries the waste away, right? Uh, there are hundreds of these things in that public toilet facility, so it could, it could fit, you know, lots and lots of people in there. There was no division in that place, by the way, between men's and women's facilities. So, you know, there's not a lot of privacy uh, afforded, but uh, a place to go, certainly, if you... Um, if the call of nature is quite urgent. Uh, this is an aqueduct. Uh, one of the, you know, the key features that allowed Roman cities to exist at all was the fact that Romans came up with ways to get fresh water from mountain springs into the cities. And all that that entails is a pipe for the water to travel in. But if the water has to pass over any large gap, any chasm or something like that, you have to keep, they didn't have pump technology or anything like that, and so they had to use gravity. You have to keep the pipe at a steady incline, not too uh, steep a drop, otherwise, you know, the, the water's going to build up too much momentum. Um, 
but uh, a gradual slope. And so they built these uh, arched structures like this one. This is in southern France, or rather what was then southern Gaul. Um, and the, the water pipe runs through this part, um, and it would be taken to the cities uh, and stored in cisterns. And anyone could go to the cistern and get fresh water. This was a, a public amenity. The other thing about public works that's important is they provide jobs. They keep people in work. Um, and the Romans were constantly building, constantly improving. Uh, and this was all for uh, the benefit of the people who lived in these places. Um, and so, you know, as a result of this, people were uh, willing to live under Roman rule. The Romans were, were tolerant. They provided a lot of things. Uh, there was this wonderful sketch, and I will I will put this as a link on uh, the modules tab. Uh, but it's a, a short video from the life of Brian, uh, a Monty Python film. Um, and you'll note in that film that um, uh, it's only about a couple of minutes long. But uh, the characters say, "Well, you know, they want to rebel against Rome." And and uh, John Cleese's character says, "Well, what have the Romans ever done for us?" And somebody raises his hand and says, "Well, the aqueduct." And he's like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, that is one thing the Romans did for us. And then, you know, somebody else says, well, um, uh, public sanitation, right? Uh, and, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, the city was a real mess before the Romans got here. And then, you know, one says, well, they like to keep order. They have a police force. And, and then somebody else says education. And then somebody else says the wine. And, and they sort of go through this whole list of things the Romans have done for them. And then finally, you know, John Cleese's character says, well, okay, apart from, and then he lists off like 15 things, what have the Romans ever done for us, right? Um, and I think that that's quite demonstrative of why the Roman Empire was, was a success, why it maintained stability for such a long period of time, why it got buy-in from such diverse peoples. So we'll continue the conversation next time, get into the third century. We're also going to take up the, the topic of Christianity uh, which becomes a major force in the Roman Empire in late antiquity next time. So uh, you can look forward to that.